Okay, we're going to get started. Welcome to the June meeting of the Johnson Space Center Astronomical Society. I'm Doug Holm, president of the JSCAS, and here is our agenda for this evening. Okay, so tonight we're going to have a series of short talks, and uh, as we were putting our presentations together, they wound up being a little longer than we expected. So uh, Al Mowry, who is going to do Building My Equatorial Mount Telescope, has agreed to be our main speaker next month. But so he will not be uh, doing his talk tonight, but he will, you'll be seeing him next month. So during our presentations, if you have questions or comments that you would like to uh, provide to our presenters, you can either put them as YouTube comments in the YouTube chat area, or you can email them to the email address below jscslive at gmail.com. All right, so first up, Tonight, we have David Havlin, who is going to bring us EAA at the George Observatory. Take it away, David. David, All you right. have a go. All right. Thanks, guys. Um, we're going to talk, as Doug, Doug mentioned, we're going to talk about EAA in the West Dome. Um, there we go. What is EAA? EAA stands for Electronic Assisted Astronomy and there are, it does differ from astrophotography in that astrophotography has a little more processing that goes on. EAA can be processed very, very quickly. Um, I wanna stop a second and say, but there's a, number, a few of us that are dabbling with EAA. Um, our own Trevor has been uh, doing, doing a, a uh, exceptional job with that as well. Some of the image I'll show tonight are also his. If you want to pursue this a little further, and I don't think membership is required, um, HAS has an EAA SIG. I'm a part of that, but I have to admit I've only been to maybe two two meetings since it's, since the thing has uh, since the inception of the of the SIG group. But they are always welcoming new members. Also, some of you may have uh, heard about this unistellar uh, EV scope. It basically works on the EAA principle. Our own um, Ed Malowitz has one of these, and Maynard Pittendre of the um, uh, Astronomical League just gave a talk last month at F FBAC on these. They're a little pricey, but they, they do an incredible job, even in um, uh, urban light polluted skies. So as I said, where this this is where we, we process short, short exposure images, stack them and adjust them for color and saturation, and then put them onto a screen. It gets it onto a screen very, very quickly. All you need is about five or six images and you can begin to, to get an image out there. And EAA, it turns out back in March of 2021 was the only acceptable way that the HMNS felt that the George Observatory could open safely in the midst of the pandemic. Otherwise, the George would have had to remain closed until probably very recently. <clears throat> to some, EAA is all the imaging they care to do. Um, Joel Brewer at HAS and FBAC, that's all he does. Uh, he lets his kids uh, do the processing because he claims to be colorblind, but he lets them do it. And I think it's, I think his wife, Becky, gives the, the figure the thumbs up or the thumbs down and the kids keep going and he has a lot of fun. It gets you images very, very quickly, but you're not going to get that high resolution detail that you will see in Jeff Lepp, Doug, uh, Doug's or Chris's or some of um, other uh, other of Trevor's images. It also depends on what your personal uh, imaging objectives are. EAA in the West Dome uh, was done here off the, the Celestron C14. It's an F11, uh, 3,900 millimeter focal length, and it's mounted on a Paramount ME. The decision was made to use the same camera in all three domes so that ideally I could go to the East Dome and help, help out somebody who's driving that one or go to, the, go to the Research Dome and do likewise. So we all have the, uh, all have the same camera. I'll talk about that shortly. EAA benefits is that it lets us see dim objects. It lets us see them in color. Multiple people can view as, they, as this is projected onto a screen through software called a SharpCap that hopefully I'll have time to demonstrate in a bit. It's a little less exhausting for the operator. It's safer for the public. And we don't have to teach the public averted vision. Not that I don't mind doing that, but some people get it and some people don't. The visual benefits, of course, as we know, as you experience the photons with your own eyes, planets look a lot better. Stars do look a little bit better. 
uh, but does, this does not require precise tracking. And it's a little simpler. You don't have to have all that, all the fancy equipment. You, you, it's kind of tough to do EAA on a DAB that is not tracking. So you've got some equipment, equipment considerations to, take, to, to, to deal with. Also, to be honest, and this is a personal opinion, when we lose Orion in the la latter part of March, up until where we're getting about right now, the sky is exciting for us astronomers, but it's kind of boring for the general public. Unless you've got a decent aperture scope and you're pulling in uh, uh, modest sized gal galaxies or globular clusters, mm, yeah, I, somebody's out there is gonna argue and that's fine. There's not a lot out there to see that we can quickly show to the public. Well, with EAA, we can actually bridge that gap because we can show galaxies and and dial them in or dial them in relatively well. Um, I've had somebody look at Orion and then I had to change to another object in the West Dome. And I went to an open cluster and they looked at me and said, is that all there is? It's like, well, kind of anticlimactic. I couldn't quite pump up the open cluster very well. So... Anyways, moving on. There are things to uh, ponder, uh, and it's not to be salty at visual, but as I said, I kind of took the thunder out of this. Uh, spring and early summer skies are loaded with globs, galaxies, and, and, and open clusters, but uh, some of the objects can be kind of anticlimactic. So even if we go to full visual, as we're as starting to in the uh, at the George Observatory, many of us uh, TOs feel that EA will still have a place, as it can show detail, and even with short exposures, will show things that can't be seen visually. So the the, the dorky catchy term is EAA is here to stay. At the last last I heard, the research dome is going to go visual, uh, but there are talks that the east dome and the west dome will still stay with uh, with EAA. Oops, I don't have to go down. You don't have, you don't want to buy a cooled CMOS camera. You don't have to. There's people doing EAA uh, with iPhones. Uh, I don't know how successful they are with Androids. I think uh, I'm an Android fan, but honestly, I think uh, photo, the photographic edge is probably with the iPhone. I think you've got a little bit more exposure control with the iPhones. You can get the uncooled. Uh, QHY or ZWO uh, cameras, such as shown here, uh, or you can actually put on a DSLR if you have it. You know, don't worry about it modified or unmodified. The idea here is to get pictures of something you like, and you can work that with your uh, work that with your shutter release. So again, as I mentioned, we got a 14-inch Schmidt Cassegrain. All domes are using this one, the ASI 294 MC Pro. It's got a modest, uh, modest size, modest size chip. It's an 11 meg megapixel camera. This particular one is cooled, as you can see up here. Uh, we always wanted to have the option of being able to do astrophotography with it, but uh, almost every Saturday night the camera is not plugged in. We're using it uncooled uh, for that reason. But also, again, to maintain consistency between the three domes, all three domes use exactly the same model camera. Oh, okay. Here are the details on the uh, on the uh, on the two ninety four MC four point six microns modest size chip. Air pattern is here. Um, you can look up on you know, on any of the vendors. Um, B and H, um, ast um, astronomic, ast not astrometrics. Okay. And anyways, Astromark. That's what I was. That's what I was searching for, and get all the uh, all the, the the really nitty gory details. It's it's a pretty decent camera, and right now I still think the the street 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 price is about nine ninety five for them. When you plug in, is a solid choice for all three domes. When you plug in the, into astronomy tools, and you punch out the camera, the focal length, CCD pixel size, whether or not you're using a reducer. This tool tries to give you a general idea whether or not your camera is going to, uh, I believe what's called over or under sample. So as long as you're kind of in the green, uh, it's a reasonable choice. And then if you're kind of going to, if it strays outside that as it does, oops, that was a hidden slide. Sorry. I had all three domes on this, uh, on this uh, uh, program and it turned out the um, uh, 36 is a bit too big for the, uh, 
bit too big for the uh, for the 294 camera. The bar is way down here into the blue, so we need to, to probably find a different camera for it. Uh, but again, you're welcome to that uh, that website. Check things out with your scope and possibly your your camera of choice. To drive the scope, we use Sky X, as you can see here. Uh, the West Dome actually died. Uh, I think it was the weekend before last. Excuse me. Uh, the aging computer that's still on Windows 7, the power supply finally gave up the ghost. And when you've got a computer that has survived as long as it has in the swamp, you know, give the computer its due burial. But we need a new computer and right now for that reason. The West Dome is currently down. Sits there and stands on this. The Paramount is driven by the Sky X. The new version of Sky X has to have Windows 10. So that's already mandating the, 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 the purchase of the new computer. In the West Dome, we have a little thing called cable management. I know anybody that's done um, astrophotography, cable management and tie wraps. You're usually one with the tie wraps to make sure all the cables don't get tied into each other. Or as the scopes lose in any direction, the cables don't bind. Well, this one is actually what controls the sash in the West Dome. And then when you sit here with the camera, the one cable for the, the one cable for the ties to the camera, this is actually the coiled one actually runs the joystick uh, to the uh, to the Paramount. You've got a communication table, power cable, and then you've also got, as you've got uh, an HDMI cable because on the other side of this computer, we've got it connected to an HDMI cable that runs outside and we're showing this on the outside of, of the dome through monitors. All the domes were doing this. And then to make matters worse, and this is you know, this is back in February where it was cold. Unlike now, because of all the cables laying around, you had to know and feel with your feet if you had cables on top or underneath, and whether or not it was safe to step. As such, the West Dome was a little bit of a hazard, and we uh, could not have couldn't have people in there other than the operators. And the operators had to be very clear with each other where they were and where the cables where the cables were. So obviously, you don't continue to step if you're in this situation. On the computer itself that we're using to drive the camera, this is under this, we've got a uh, sharp cap, it's free, but the upgrade to the pro version is what we need in order to do live stacking. So to get the live, live pro version, the pro version, it's 12 pounds or a bank breaking uh, 16, uh, 1669. And many of us have already deep pocketed this because of its, the program is actually quite good. So I have the computer, your mouse. This is tying up, literally coming right up here, ties to the computer. Wherever the scope moves, wherever the butt end of the scope moves, I have to pick up this table and move it. Uh, the, yes, there are longer cables, so why don't we use that? We do. We have a nine-foot cable. but we will, we'll, It's long enough, though, that we will get um, drops signal drops from the camera. And honestly, I find this small three foot cable much more reliable. So that's my first first preference when I'm in there. Connect it here, connect it up there. I'll just pick up the table and move and then I will plug the power cord in either the wall, the wall to the east or way over on the other side, the wall to the west. And as I said, I'll just pick up this table and move it around. East Dome has the luxury of having under carpeting cable and they can, uh, uh, they've got a, a credenza for the two monitors and maybe we'll do something like that for the West Dome. But right now you work with what you've got. Back of the cabling of the mount here, communications, these two communicating to the computer, this drives the joystick and this is draping down. This is actually what operates the sash up top. So you can see it's it, it's kind of a busy place, and it's not some place where we have uh, more than welcome to have volunteers, but definitely not volunteers who like to run. It's not a good thing. Now, what I can do here is this is often a, con a convenient uh, thing. Here's the, where am I? There's a mouse. I've got the inside of the dome here, and we've run it all out here to the outside monitor. And it's a modest monitor. It's a 30-inch monitor, and that, at that time, let us have people uh, at social, you know, at so, observe social distancing, and see things on the screen. One of the times when the moon is out, um, I will actually pull up. I'll actually bring my laptop and run uh, Fire Capture. This is Fire Capture, not Sharp Cap. 
But what it lets me do is actually bring the mouse and the joystick, which you can't see in this photography, in this picture. I tried to muck with it to try to show these, and I completely obliterated the whole thing. So you just have to take my, take my word, word on it. There's the joystick to the mount, and then here's the mouse. So with the mouse, I can control what's going on in SharpCap. And with the joystick, I can actually control the scope and walk it around and give people guided tours of the moon. Connie says I'm in my element when I do that, and it's probably true. <laughs> okay, so to, pro to work with it, the electronic assisted astronomy, uh, we're using SharpCap, and here's an uh, thing of SharpCap here. This was actually the night that Joel Brewer helped us get the uh, uh, horse head that you can see here. Uh, it does let us see things that uh, we can't normally see visually. These are done, as I said, with short exposures, and I'll talk about those, talk about those shortly. The fun thing of the, of the operation of the West Dome is the tracking challenges depending on the on the on the scope or the dome you're in. East Dome requires tracking. Research Dome requires tracking. The West Dome, fortunately, with the Paramount, has got a little bit of drift, but it's tolerable. And a uh, uh, sidebar to Trevor, it's actually been greatly approved when since when Jeff left helped helped do a minor uh, realignment to uh, 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 Polaris. Focus is the major challenge, especially on the screen. It's almost, it's very difficult to focus on the screen and we periodically need to check the collimation. Now, Jay Thomas of FBAC bought one of these nifty uh, tri off focus and collimation masks so we can kind of have the best of both worlds. We can use it for collimation and uh, uh, focusing. And as you can see here, what you're looking at here is the star pattern you would get in a star, and this is one is where, where it's focused. And you can tell because all the radians that are coming off all, all around the, the, the six points are all fairly equal. And what's important is the lines going through dead center in each of these center axes. As long as those are dead, those are dead center, tells you that the scope is collimated. If the collimation is wackadoodle, that center line will be off, and you can go that way. Uh, you can also do the old star method, which is what I've what, what we've done before. Actually, the last time um, Tracy asked me to check the collimation on it, I did have to make an adjustment. And honest, I'll be honest, I use a, col a combination of the tribatina focusing math mask and the old uh, star uh, concentric uh, concentric circles and an out of focus star. David. Yeah. Uh, back on the uh, sharp cap. What types of parameters can you set for live stacking? Um, let me answer that if when I can get to the, I'm going to try to actually do a live stacking. So if it's talking about color balance and things like that, let me get to that when I when I get to that that part of the demo. I actually have in the background sharp cap and a quick and dirty set of data files of M42 that I'm going to try to uh, work comma slash bluff my way through. <laughs> All right, thank you. All right. Um, so for the first basic swept, basic steps is you swap uh, the camera for the eyepiece because the focal plane is different. They're not par focal. You need to find a reasonably bright star in the same area as the desired object, preferably as close as possible to make your life easier. Um, center it in on the, on the spotting scope, focus it in with a batten off mask from within sharp cap, and you're looking at the result of the Batnoff mask on the screen. Then swing over the desired object and you, pro, you presume it's focused. Now the focus will change through the evening as a function of humidity. I have found even focusing on the moon, uh, the moon will be nice and crisp and then uh, not half an hour later with a change of humidity, I'll need to go back and readjust it, readjust the focus. In sharp cap, we initially work the gain exposure to see the object on the screen, regardless of the noise you're going to have. Usually medium to high gain, and yeah, that's high gain. It's 179 here in this snippet example. I'll, I'll run it as high as 200 and have um, uh, five to 15 second exposures. Exposure exposure line here is not not is not shown. Once there, and you've got an image. Then you, we work both down to, to, uh, to reduce the noise. And then we start stacking. The only processing is via sharp cap. We work the gain down to about 120. That's when it has its inflection point and where it starts getting more, more sensitive. But I've had it at one point where I was able to have a gain of about 120 and have uh, M42 clocking in with maybe three second exposures, two second exposures at point 0.0. 
times. And we just readjust the colors and go from there. There is no Photoshop at this point. Technically, the minute you start pulling Photoshop in, you're doing astrophotography. But the idea here, understand, is we've got people wanting to see what's up on the night sky. So the idea is speed is to get the image up and processed and on the screen as quick as possible. So training in the West Dome has been a challenge. Normally, prior pre-pandemic, all we had to do is get you up on the C-14, care and, care and feeding of the C-14, SkyX, and basic dome operation, and you are good. Well, now, now of recent, it became, now we got to figure out the camera, EAA, and figure out sharp cap. Now, some like, I, I like Don Selly of HAS's uh, point of view, uh, EAA can be a... Um, gateway drug, if you will. And I could just say people could go, oh, this is kind of cool. This is kind of fun. And it leads them into full-blown astrophotography. Um, again, though, some people are more than happy with just e happy with just EAA. Then ideally to get certified, you got to combine the two and combine everything. What helped me leapfrog a few things has been my experience with lunar imaging, even though I use a different, uh, a different uh, uh, software platform for that. So as I said, we work the gate exposure to see the object, and we go and we go from there. Okay, let's go in for some actual images. This was actually imaged by our own Trevor, Trevor Quinn back in April of uh, 2021. He and I met up down there. Um, the actual number of exposures and uh, the exposure itself escapes me, but as a rule, these are anywhere, anything, everything I'm going to show you is going to be anywhere between 20, 25, and 60 to 100 exposures. And the exposure length can be anywhere from 5 seconds to 15 to 15 to, eight to 18 seconds. But he uh, nabbed this one of, M, of, of um, M51. And you can see a spiral galaxy. You've got decent structure. You've got some of these little wisps. You've got that arm coming up and coming out. You might get some of this visually, but you wouldn't get all of it. Now, granted, there's Trevor images, Trevor's image, and then over here to the right, unfortunately, is the now the late Lloyd Overcash's spectacular image, where you can see quite a bit. Now, this is the difference between astrophotography and EAA. Trevor and I grabbed this. Trevor did all the work, so I shouldn't even include myself. Um, Trevor got this image and worked this image up in probably a good good ten minutes, and then after that, we just let it stack and stack away. Integration time was an hour and three hour and three quarters for Lloyd's image. Uh, I don't have any data how long it took him to process, but I can tell you it probably took him uh, probably took him a while. Experienced though as he is. There's another one by Trevor M101. You can see all these little wisps that are coming up, and these are coming up with these really short short exposures. But the cool thing here is you're actually seeing the structure. Of the uh, of of the galaxy, uh, Trevor Quinn also got this one. I think uh, Jay Thomas also wanted to fight for this one. M eighty two. There's a little ripple in here that is caused by, I believe, I don't want to say a supernova, but there's a cause for that little ripple. I'm sure if Justin's out there somewhere, he'll 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 tell me what it is. But you can almost see a little dip up here, a little dip over here. I mean, this thing is 12 million light years away. Um, one of the key object things you can't, you just can't go for every any object you want. Um, you've got to, where's my control key? There it is. You've got to find objects and be careful of objects that have a certain level of surface brightness. Then you'll be able to nab them real quick. If they have a very low surface brightness and their overall magnitude is pretty low. EAA is going to have a little bit of a problem. You're going to be looking at very long exposures. And the problem with long exposures is if their focusing is off or your exposure is off, you won't know until the next exposure is done. So if you have an exposure of 23 seconds, you have to wait until second 24 when it starts over and you get the new image to try to make a correction. And then it's kind of a guesstimate how to make that correction. So we can kind of save, save ourselves some of the headache by picking picking objects that have decent uh, de decent surface brightness, uh, M57 one of the uh, visual one of the more visual things that we can see might be visually but just not in color and trying to get people to look at that through a scope, um, telling people about uh, telling the public about inverted inverted vision sometimes doesn't end well, but if you got EAA you can actually pull it in quite a bit tighter. 
I pulled this in in October with the C14, and I was absolutely doing handsprings because I'd never, I didn't think I was going to be able to pull out that center star. But actually, not only pulled out the center star, pulled out some, pulled out some color. It was a pretty, pretty, pretty decent image. <clears throat> uh, Jay Thomas really wanted. Oops, I did not want that. Jay Thomas and I one night he was he had a he he had a he had a burr in his backside. He wanted M77. 55 million light years, fairly dim, but you could actually get the elements of the spiral in this. And this is another galaxy just off to the side here. I'm sorry, that's a star. These little guys over here, but getting some structure here. He he fought for about 20 minutes to pull up the image. But once it was there, it was on the screen. It worked out really, really well. <clears throat> Orion Nebula. And this is EAA. This is not uh, astrophotography. You can get, see the little guy, the running man over here. I'm sorry, the other one over here. And you can get all of this structure out here. It becomes kind of a, uh, I won't say a battle, but it now starts becoming an artistic thing. If you want, really want to pull out the reds, then you want to pull the red slider out a little bit. Uh, you've got your trapezium right here. I'll show you that when I get to the uh, 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 demonstration side of it. Honestly, I've shot this so many times over the last last four or five months. I'm not even, I'm not sure who took this one. I usually grab all the data that everyone has taken off the West Dome computer and I bring it home. And actually, what I do is I practice or a little bit on Sunday morning on just processing. Because the idea is you want to get this going quick, particularly if you're in the dome. You don't want people standing around uh, twiddling their fingers, belly aching that they came to, they, they paid to see something and they're not seeing it. So you need to be kind of quick. So I'll take other people's data and practice uh, pulling out the images. There's the EAA image. This one was imaged by uh, Chris Marset of HAS, and he did this out of a two-inch refractor. Total integration time, he said, was about two and a half hours. This is one of his first astrophotography images that he did. He said it took him over 18 hours to process this. Now, he, since then, of course, he said he's made it, managed to get it down to about three to four hours. But this was just done, and I'll probably be able to do that for you tonight. But there is a world of difference in the quality, so it depends what you want to do. So, yeah, this is quick and dirty and easy, but this gives you the structure and all the detail you want to see. So I can see why this can lead can lead to, to, lead to this. Yeah, it can lead you into astrophotography if you're not careful. Um, again, here's the uh, uh, horse head designation, uh, Bernard's 33 and Anna Ryan. Um, Joel Brewer is very experienced with shark cap. I'll mention him shortly in another couple of slides. Uh, I say image taken by me and Joel Brewer. The image was done almost exclusively by him. I was driving the dome. Uh, we had a little problem with this picture because the inside of the West Dome is white. Well, our lights for our, uh, our vision are red. Guess what we were fighting? We were fighting a red glow in there. We had to actually almost turn the in inside lights off and then try to shield the screen because we were starting to get an internal reflection from inside the dome of the computer screen from which we were trying to process this image. So it's a long-winded way of saying our own screen image was hampering our processing of this image. <laughs> so we had a few things, a few things to work out. Um, yes, it wouldn't be me if I didn't grab one of the moon down here is Tycho. I grabbed this one off the camera and I simply work this up in, um, uh, auto stackered, but I grabbed this one off the, uh, off, off the C14 with the, uh, two, 294 MC in monochrome mode. Now I consider myself just a hack and I'm still learning. So I don't know anywhere near what, uh, anywhere near sharp cap as well as I know, uh, auto stacker and fire capture. So if there are errors to be made, I've very likely, uh, very likely have done it and will continue to make them. It's, it's all part of the learning process. So if you have questions, don't hesitate to ask. However, uh, FBAC took part in uh, HAS's side of the TS uh, the side of the TSP live talk, and the YouTube link is here. So by all means, feel free to scribble that down or take a picture of it. Both Jeff Lepp and Joel Brewer talk about live stacking and sharp cap, and they're going to do a far better job than I'm going to do tonight in discussing it. 
However, you've got to work your way out to about the three hour and 27 minute mark because there are other, other speakers and other things going on. But this is pretty much where they uh, take over and start discussing uh, live stacking and sharp cap. And that's, um, uh, there are a number of YouTube videos about sharp cap, but honestly, what we're doing is pretty much what they describe and the two of them describe it, describe it in, 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 in very good detail. So, hey, David. Yeah. Uh, have they experimented with an image intensifier as part of EAA imaging train? Uh, Fred Miller had one at Fort McCavitt this year. Did he? Okay. No, nothing like that at the George because, we try, as again, we try to have to get F back on board for the East Dome and the, and the museum's got to get on board with the other two domes. So they haven't tried tried that. Um, okay, so I'm going to work my way through some stacking. Uh, we can talk briefly about the data sets. Uh, SharpCap gives you uh, the options of all four formats, JPEG, FITs, TIFFs, and PNGs. I was collecting mainly in TIFFs. Jeff is a purist as a uh, as a uh, uh, astrophotographer. Uh, I won't mention names here in this club, but some people here might prefer tip FITs. The data is very well preserved, of course, in those. Um, it's actually an astro astronomical uh, format. As I said, mistakes were to be made. I made them. I collected, initially collected everything in PNGs. Um, there's not a lot of data kept in PNGs. The same files that are PNGs that might be 185K are going to be close to 24 to 28 meg in a FITS file. And if you, I would say collect in fits if you think you might want to take it to the next level, take it into Photoshop and other things where you're going to have more data to work with. But I'll be honest, the pictures that I that I took before I set the defaults in SharpCap are here in PNGs, so it's fairly uh, fairly limited. Okay, I am going to change screens real quick. I get out of that, drop that. I'm going to come up here into SharpCap. Now, this is sharp cap as it would normally be as you come up. Um, I don't want to give the whole tour of the software, but you can pull down sharp cap very easily and get the feel of it. You can come over here into the camera selection and you can. It's got a, a OBS virtual camera. It's a web. You've got there, there's a HD pro webcam that you can connect to. If you have a camera that you can connect to the computer, Get the drivers, get the, the drivers that are needed to make it, make the uh, sharp cap recognize your camera and go from there. I have my QHY lunar camera connected. I've got my, my 40D ready to go with it. And since I've used the um, uh, 294MC, I've got the 294MC drivers in place and well, and those will all show up there. When you connect it, it connects to your camera. Sharp cap thinks you're ready to do business. It starts taking pictures. And all of a sudden, when I connected it to my 40D, it started taking pictures right there in the living room. And Connie says, how come your pictures, how come your camera's clicking away? Well, it's snagging, snagging, snagging pictures of the inside of the lens cap. So there you go. Um, output format, SEER file would be a, would be a, 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 a video file. I normally would do that as a, as a WMV. This would be the place where, let me go with highlight the mouse again. Oh, it's not. This is not PowerPoint. Okay, sorry. Um, output format. This is where you would pick um, the output format you want for your pictures. Uh, resolution will always be at the camera maximum. And then uh, camera controls is not maximized here. Let's see if I can, I can play that. Play that game. You get image control. It's it's somewhat limited when you don't have a camera actually put up to it. You can do darks and flats. Uh, you can do the basics of um, image processing uh, with it. If you've got darks and flats, so I'm going to let it go at that point. Um, there's, as I said, there are plenty of YouTube videos on just getting started with SharpCap, but then the actual act of live uh, stacking, I would again encourage you to go look at that one video. So I'm going to come up here to camera, and I'm going to go down to camera fo mo folder monitor camera. That's the one I'm going to need to use for this. And what it is, I come down and browse, and it's already looking in my desktop where I've got M42 test files, and they're all they're all PNGs. I have 120 of them. 
And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and tell it um, this is the data I'm selected. I'm going to go ahead and click play and you're going to I'm going to go ahead and hit it. Oh, okay. I, I hear you, Trevor. What's up? Uh, we, we lost your audio for a second. Oh, whoops. Not by intent, I hope. <laughs> so I'm going to go ahead and hit play. And I'm going to see how this goes. And there is it stacking in. And I need to. There we go. Come in here as it comes in, as it piles in more data, you can see it's stacking in. Now, this is this is a lucky stack. It's coming in nicely. They normally don't come in this way. Sometimes they'll come in all cattywampus. Colors will be off. Um, that's how it first starts coming in. And then you have to come in over and see over here in the overview where it says frames stacked or frames ignored, that's going to be the function of your telescope. There are other things in here I can show you, but it won't really won't do much good as far as the drift drift ah, drift graph and stacking menus. I don't think that no, it's not going to show me anything. I don't think drift will either. Yeah, okay, that's going to give me the general drift of the pictures that were entered in as it goes. The uh, alignment will let you know how well your, your, your camera, you know, how well your mount is actually working. And uh, as a sidebar, SharpCap apparently has a, an exceptional polar alignment feature in it that many, many use. Even though they may not use SharpCap for their actual image capture, they use it for polar alignment. Now, I've got this one here, and it actually swallowed all 120, all 120 PNGs. Um, Let's see, do an auto stretch, and then you then it's just a question of playing for the what what you want as far as your uh, as far as your image. You can gack it up, blow it out, play with it. That's the whole idea. Now the other thing is that we're discussing in the um, in the F back club, and it'd be open to other people too. And I have no problem putting this data set. Of these figures in a uh, Google Share Drive, so that if you get Sharp Cap and you get the Pro option, you can pull this data down and play with it. And what I would do is I would include uh, my version of what I think is a good is a, is a good stack, and as well as the data files, and you know, it's kind of a friendly competition. See if you can do any better. So I'm going to fix what I screwed up here. You can actually click on these and. You can slide them. You got the sliders here. You can also click it above and down. Let's see, where am I going? I'm going that way. I need to go. Oh, let's bring bring the blues down because the blues are the ones I really screwed up. This one is more your 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 gross um, uh, color palette adjustment. This one over here is your fine adjustment. So I'm going to muck with that one a little bit too. And that stretched it out. And now here it is. It's really, as I just said, it's how much art and taste you want to put in. How much detail do you want to put in? I really like the stuff that's hanging up here. But if I make the adjustments too much, I really come in. Some people would say, oh, no, no, that, that, that's what you need. No, I, I, I don't believe it. I want to have it elsewhere. I want to move it where I can actually begin to see some structure. The idea is play with it and see, figure out what you like and what works for you and what are you trying to show in the image. Now, I've gotten the structure of these clouds out here because I'm really, really interested. But I'll be honest, I've totally blown out the trapezius. Well, if I want to try to get the trapezius back, oops, wrong way. I need to really kind of tighten down. Let's see if I go to the outside a little bit more. Let's come back in the inside. Okay, there I might have the four separate stars, but I've lost all the resolution and detail of the really nifty structure that I like. So it's how you want to play that game. This is score one for astrophotography because I think as Doug, Trevor, and Chris can tell you, you can make exposures for here and you can make exposures from here and try to get 
a, a good artistic blend. That's where EAA may not go. So I, I tend to like trying to get an overall picture of the whole structure of what I'm looking at. And as I said, I really enjoy staring at these clouds and all of the structures you can see out here. Um, so without belaboring it, I'm going to call it there. That's the, the, the demo for SharpCap that I wanted to do. And as I said, um, uh, I could turn this and have it saved as a final image, and I have no problem sharing uh, that data because these guys are details, details. Okay. I, oh, these. Oh, these are TIFFs. These aren't PNGs. Okay, my mistake. I also have. I've also done this with PNGs. So this is obviously way too much to email. I would have to put these up on a. Uh, excuse me, on a Google Share Drive. But uh, I have no problem sharing any of the data that we've generated in the West Dome. So I'd be happy to call it and take any questions. Uh, okay, here's one. Uh, during the live stacking, is there a limit on how many images can be stacked? And can we assume it just keeps stacking the most recent image as you go along? Okay. Uh, no. Good, good. Actually, good question. No, unless you tell it to shut up, it will keep stacking and stacking and stacking. I think the last time I was out there for M42, I must have had a file of, uh, of four or 500 images. Uh, sometimes things will cause you to have to go back and do a reset. You might have to go back and re re redo the uh, 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 focus. Um, I found by slipping um, <laughs> on a co comedic oops side, I'm thinking, oh, wow, those images are starting to get kind of weird. And I realized the uh, uh, image had rotated, the scope had rotated, but we had not rotated the dome, and we were starting to take take uh, clipped pick, clipped images from the inside of the dome. So there is one place where I would tell it to stop, and then and then uh, uh, then reset and get going. But I, I've I've walked off with data files three four hundred long. Um, okay, yeah. <laughs> Anything else? Uh, I don't see anything else, David. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and send it back over to Doug. Okay. All right, Doug. Okay, David, thank you very much for that presentation, and uh, thanks for all the work you put into putting it together for us. Next up, we have Trevor Quinn with Testing Topaz Denoise AI and Sharpen AI. Um, Trevor actually showed us some pictures recently uh, that he'd been messing around with this new program, and uh, they're pretty impressive. So we asked him if he could put together a talk for us, and, and he did that. So take it away, Trevor. Uh, thank you, Doug. All right. So how I came about this was I saw uh, quite a few uh, discussions about using this with astrophotography and what it can do on some of the discussion boards. Uh, so I was intrigued. I wanted to take a look and said, is this thing really worth what everybody's talking about? So that's what brought this about. Uh, so let's get started with testing Topaz Labs, denoise, and AI sharpening. Uh, Uh, what I'm going to do initially is just give you a rundown of the program. Uh, so I've got a short video to start with, and uh, I will be narrating over top of the video. Okay, so this is the uh, general interface. Uh, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and load in one of my uh, already processed astro photos, uh, and we're, we'll take a look here. I got to find it in the, the list, and uh, we'll open it up, and it's going to automatically start trying to do the processing with the uh, system. 
Uh, now there's several different views that you can look at and uh, in this one it's kind of a, a reveal as it goes and once it finishes you, there's a status bar down here uh, down here at the bottom and as you can see when you move that slider back across um, it in this mode it is without and then you can get a side by side of uh, what the process looks like uh, and you have these uh, modes uh, these AI modes right here. And uh, now this is showing four of the AI modes all at once, and you can pick uh, which one you like. Uh, and I've got it set for, with their auto settings where it's it's making the, uh, it's taking and looking at each of the images and determining what settings it thinks it needs. Uh, and if you choose to adjust those further, you can. Uh, it just takes it off of the uh, automatic. Uh, but uh, as you can see, it's now finishing the fourth one. Uh, and in this, it really does a good job at clearing out that noise. And what I'll do is I'll zoom in here on these four images, and you can see them a little bit better as they as they do their process. Because uh, it'll once I resume, it'll start to. Uh, uh, redo the calculation and you can see the noise in the images and you can see it kind of disappearing as it goes through and that's about all with the uh, uh, actual uh, video here so what i've done is i've taken now uh, these photos okay so this is my original processed image uh, of uh, the flame and horse head uh, then and, and you can see all the noise down in here and up in here and around in here and then I've run it through this program and uh, once I got rid of the noise I took it back in and did some more uh, stretches in Photoshop and all the noise is gone but once the noise was gone it allowed me to do more stretching and I was able to pull out more detail uh, and nebulosity. Uh, it was just amazing of, of the results uh, that I could get. Uh, so this was primarily using just the denoise program and then Photoshop. Uh, so in order to test the sharpening one, uh, I took an image that uh, Chris Wells and I had done back last year on Jupiter, and I'll show you that next. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, here's the side-by-side -side comparison of the whole thing. So you can see, uh, you know, the, the original noisy image versus the, the cleaned up version and how much uh, better it looks. Uh, and more detail that I was able to bring out because of the uh, reducing the noise. Okay, here's the uh, now here's the Jupiter image. Uh, so you can see it's kind of noisy, uh, or it, it almost appears out of focus a little bit. Uh, so on this one, I actually used the uh, Sharpen AI and the and the denoise programs. Uh, so, uh, and then this is, now I'm going to switch over to the, uh, the final version of that. And you can see how much clearer that image became of Jupiter. And that just blew me away when I saw that, uh, that result, uh, you know, how, how clear the eye, the great red spot is, uh, these wisps uh up here uh, you know these marks up here in the north uh and down here in the south and how much more uh clean these lines uh between the cloud bands are uh so then i'm going to switch over to a side-by-side uh, -side view so you can see what i started with and what i ended up with
so uh, then uh, moving on, uh, wanted to just kind of talk about the program itself a little bit more. So uh, the the program they they've designed it to where um, it can run as a standalone uh, program, or each component is a standalone program, uh, and it can run on a Mac or a PC, uh, and then it can also be utilized uh, and can be invoked from within uh, Adobe Lightroom or Adobe Photoshop. Uh, so you can reach, you can be processing your image in Photoshop, reach out from Photoshop, invoke this, do your stuff here, and then hit apply, and it brings it back into your uh, Photoshop. And the when it does the reach out, the the image or the what I showed in the video earlier uh, with the layout of the program, it looks exactly the same when you reach out from. Uh, Photoshop versus it being the standalone. Um, additionally, they have a third product uh, that uh, that I'm not covering here, but it's uh, they call it Gigapixel AI, uh, which is a uh, resolution enhancement tool, uh, and um, it it they claim that uh, you can increase the resolution by about 600 uh, percent. So let's. Uh, look at a little bit more. So here's the website for Topaz Labs. Um, they have uh, tutorials on YouTube on how to use the product. Uh, pricing. Uh, so uh, Denoise AI, they've got it listed at $79.99 right now. Uh, Sharpen AI is $79.99. And then the Gigapixel AI is uh, $99.99. Uh, you can also get all three as a bundled, and you'll get a little bit of a discount. Now, I happened to catch it on sale, and I got the bundle of all three for $160, so $159.99. And uh, it's just an amazing tool, and I was you know, really blown away by uh, the results that I was getting out of it. And... Uh, I think that's it, uh, and I thank you, and if there's any questions, uh, please let me know if I haven't covered anything. Doug, was there anything? Sorry. Yes. Yeah, I was waiting for you to unmute my mic. So. Sorry. <laughs> I, I, I just did that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, a few questions. Uh, first, I think you answered this. Is Topaz a standard, standalone program or an add-in for Photoshop? Uh, the answer is yes. It is both. It is both. Right. Okay. Second question was, uh, what do you use? What you think is a final TIFF image and then import into Topaz? I think they may be asking about what uh, file format you use. Oh yeah, I was I was working with a TIFF, uh, my finalized TIFF, and then I brought it into Topaz. Okay, very good. And um, let's see, there was one more question. Oh, okay, on the um, the w earlier when you showed four images and they were all being processed one at a time, can you uh, tell us one more time what was the difference between those four images? Uh, what those what those the differences in those four images were four of the uh, AI models that, that are available. So there was one that was uh, standard. Uh, there was one that was uh, uh, severe. Let me go back to it real quick. Uh, Yep, I'm looking at the video again real quick because I, I don't remember. But uh, yeah, there was a standard. Uh, there was one that was, I believe, is clear, uh, severe, and something else. Uh, here, we'll look at it in just a second when it opens the image. Do you know about how many different uh, models there are? Yeah, yeah, it's got uh, five different models. There's standard, clear, low light, severe noise, and raw. 
So it will actually work with raw images. Okay. Uh, but you know, a raw really isn't going to show you much uh, as as we know until it's all stacked. Right. Uh, and then the the models different. Each program has a different set of models, so they're a little bit different in in the models that are available uh, per program. Interesting. Okay. All right. Great. Any anything else? And I think that is it. Let me just check one more time. That is all the questions. Yes. Okay. And I'll send it back to you. Well, good. All right. Thank you very much for that, Trevor. That is impressive. Um, I've heard about that, but I didn't know what it was. But that is that's definitely a very interesting tool. Okay. So next up, we were going to have Al Mallory, as I as I said, but um, Al's going to be our main speaker next month. He was very flexible about that, and thank you, Al, for being flexible and going next month. Uh, next up, Lunar Eclipse. This is uh, mine and Chris Randall's, actually. So as you probably all know, there's a Lunar Eclipse on the 15th of May, and uh, you know I've 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 photographed lunar eclipses before. This is one of my images here of you know three phases of the lunar eclipse. But what was different about this one this time is there was these two stars here that were pretty bright. There's one here and there's one over here, and because of these two stars out here that I could see pretty easily, I could actually line these images up. So you know I could actually see the the moon moving as it was going through the eclipse because I could take all these three images and 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 align them with the stars and get them in their right uh, positions you know over time. So this one was at 10:21 and this one was at 11:11 and this one was at 12:01 a.m. And uh, I guess you know this may be obvious to everybody else, but I thought this was kind of cool this time is that when you line all these up. Uh, you can actually now see the Earth's shadow. And I'd like to say that I originally thought of this, but I didn't. Uh, I actually saw a Dennis Webb <laughs> had posted one on uh, Facebook that some person he know, knows had you know, made a picture like this. And I saw that and I thought, oh, I wonder if I can do that. So I went back and, and stacked three of my images. Well, I didn't stack them. I combined three images together and made this one by you know, aligning the stars from each one. But this is kind of neat because you can see along here, here's the Earth's shadow. And, uh, you know, it, it gives you an idea of how big the Earth's shadow is out at the distance of the moon, which is neat. And also illustrates how the moon didn't, didn't go like right through the middle of the Earth's shadow, but it kind of went off to one side a little bit, which is why we had these different shapes with the, uh, the shadow on here. So I, I fully admit I stole that from Dennis Webb. And he's a great guy, and he's been a member of our club for a long time, so hopefully he won't object to that I stole that uh, from his Facebook post. I don't think I told him I did that until now. Okay, uh, and then there's the final image again, same image. Next, uh, Chris Randall actually uh, submitted one. He sent one to our, our email address. This is one that Chris did the same night on the 15th. And Chris gave me some, some words to go along with it. He says this lunar eclipse is composed of 10-minute interval shots for the DSLR, the 600 millimeter telephoto lens on a Celestron CG4 German equatorial mount. A few bad frames were thrown out. So that's Chris's contribution to our lunar eclipse that we had. Thank you, Chris, for submitting. That's a great picture. I love that. Hey, Doug, uh, I have a question. Yes. We move on. Uh, so like with when Chris did the 10 minute interval type thing. Um, if you did like a, sh you know, shorter interval or whatever, uh, maybe every two minutes or something, uh, would you be able to put together a whole uh, uh, time lapse at that point? Absolutely. I mean, and that's what, yeah, that you could do that. You could actually make yourself like a little movie, which is actually, that's a really great idea, Trevor. We should do that next time. Yeah, you can make a time lapse of this thing moving along, just like we do the time lapse of the Milky Way uh, going over. But the tricky thing is, there's one tricky thing: as as this, as the moon goes from you know being a full moon like down here, 
to being completely covered, uh, your exposures have to change. So that's that's one thing that would, that would mess up that that idea. Uh, then this exposure time is really different between you know full moon and a, a fully eclipsed moon. So if yeah, so if you could right, if you could adjust the exposures and keep up with it, yeah, you could go back and make a time lapse of it. But you'd have to be really good at adjusting exposures as you went along because this uh, the the time for this is much longer than it is for you know full moon down here. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Another one that I saw that people do uh, is they just take a they take a they set a camera on a tripod and they show the whole thing like uh, like a, a line of the the moon moving from full you know to eclipse and then and to full again. Uh, those are pretty cool too. You know, see the thing in the sky that's moving along with some kind of uh, you know front drop like your house or some other structure there with the eclipsing moon behind it. That'd be another good one to try sometime. Okay, so next up, uh, Chris has a members minute, lunar transits. So Chris also, Chris Randall is very active this month. He has two things that he submitted, um, but I'm gonna present these for him. So the first one was, this is a Hubble Space Telescope lunar transit that Chris did. He did this on the 9th of May this year. And he used a Canon 60D and a 10 inch uh, Schmidt Cassegrain at F6.3. So he must have had a reducer on it. This is 31 frames, around one second of travel each, and it shows the direction that the Hubble Space Telescope was going. You can see it there, that's very neat. And then he also submitted another one. This is Tian Gan, I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Tian Gan, that's the, that's the uh, Chinese uh, uh, space station lunar transit. And here it shows the direction of travel. He did this on the 9th of May. Same setup, Canon 60D, a 10 inch F63 switch cast of grain, 26 frames and approximately one second of travel. Those were submitted by Chris Randall and he gave us some words to go along with these too. The transits are done with a DSLR on my 10 inch F63 switch cast of grain, an old 90s Mead LX6 and a WWV receiver. WWV audio is critical in finding it on your video. Processed in Adobe Premiere Elements 14 Mac and cut up into frames and stacked and edited in Adobe Photoshop Elements 14 Mac to make one image. 30 frames per second pass less than one second, so video is the only way to see it. Predictions come from transit-finder.com. Note the long range predictions always move, so you have to check just before the event, especially ISS, as it's always changing altitude. So that's, uh, you know, one thing I'm thinking about this is it's really great because, um, you know, what we're seeing, you know, David showed us EAA at the George Observatory, you know, electronic assisted astronomy, and Trevor's showing us a new cool um, software program that basically I didn't know about it. and probably most of us or some of us didn't know that. But it's kind of nice because you can see different people are doing different things and we're all kind of contributing to this and teaching each other about these things that we're experiencing. And I uh, appreciate everyone's participation because it's a lot more fun when people participate and show us what they're up to. All right, so next up we have hey, David. Doug. Oh, I'm sorry, what? Uh, uh, sorry, I missed a question when when uh, your your moon stuff was up. Oh, okay. um, and the question is, with the varying phases of the moon, did you bracket at each photographic step? That is definitely for sure, because, <laughs> yeah, because these exposures, exactly right. Uh, to get these exposures right, you try a bunch of different exposures, and then later on you see, well, which one came out right? Like, and I, I can't remember right now how long these were, but, you know, they were on the order of, you know, a second or something like that, or two seconds, or three or four seconds. Actually, now I do remember, like four seconds, and eight seconds, and six seconds. So yeah, so each one, like if the 11-11 one, I would take a bunch of different times, uh, you know, exposures, and then later on, I go back, you know, like at 11-11, I'd take maybe 10 exposures of different times, and then go back later and see which ones, you know, turned out, you know, like I like them. Also, I'm going to make one more comment about this, now I'm thinking about it. I had someone, um, actually it's another member of our club, um, 
I wish I could remember his name. His first name is Doug. I think his last name is McCorkle. <laughs> McCormick, I think. I'm so sorry if I can't remember your last name, Doug. Anyway, he's a great guy in our club, but uh, he actually mentioned to me that this one seemed a lot redder than um, other ones that he had seen. And you know, when you look you look at this through an eyepiece, it actually looks really deep red. And one thing I've noticed is that when people shoot these these uh, lunar eclipses, I think they're using DSLRs, and I think they got them set on auto white balance. And if you do that, I think the camera is trying to adjust, you know, to try to white balance this thing. And this, let me tell you, the eclipse moon is not, it's not, it's not even close to being white. I mean, it's this red thing. And so what I did with this one is I, I did, an, I did a, a custom white balance. I came in and used a whiteboard and a known four, a 4,000 Kelvin light with a known true optical white whiteboard to do a custom white balance. So I was trying to make sure I got the colors right during this lunar eclipse. So when you see these lunar eclipses and you see some that look really kind of yellowish or kind of light orange or something, my guess is that they're probably using a DSLR and they probably have the thing on auto white balance. So. All right, so Trevor, can I move on or is there anything else? I think that's it. Okay, so next up we have David with Star Party News. So we're going to bring David back uh, to talk to us again. David, I can't unmute your mic. Got it. I was waiting for your ghost signal. So there you go. Yeah, you're up. All right. And I promise I won't be anywhere near as long as, as long as I was with the uh, uh, EAA. All right. Star Party News for June. It's going to be almost a slight parrot of May. Uh, June 4th, I was out of town, but I heard Dava Palooza from, other, from the other clubs seemed to be a uh, reasonable success at uh, Land, Sea, and Sky. July 9th, all the way out to July, we've got a, a Hack Winery Outreach event. Golf course wants us back. I need to email the guy. He would like to have us sometime in uh, in August. So I need to discuss dates. And I'm going to try to make sure the moon's in play for that one. September 2nd, Hack again. October 20th Fort Mc to the 22nd, Fort McCavitt. That is a confirmed date. October 28th, Houston All Clubs, and October 29th, uh, me, Leonard, and uh, Tracy and Kavita need to get together and see how we're going to work a day. They don't think they're going. They want the uh, 2,500 plus coming through the gate, so it may be a uh, low price ticketed event. Those details need to be worked out. Um, let's see. November 4th, another hack winery, and then out of sync, I just added these. Uh, I need to place them temporarily where they need to be. Uh, we've got enough people going to, as Doug mentioned, enough people going to Ogie Tex and El Dorado that I think we need to put these on the calendar. Um, uh, I, I won't say permanently, but for as long as people are going. Ogie Tex, September 23rd to October 1st. El Dorado, October 24th through 29th. That'll be a new moon because the following weekend is first quarter for Astronomy Day. Uh, I've been chatting with Paul quite a bit. Mazatlan 2024, if you want to make plans, um, Eclipse Tours is leading a trek to uh, Mazatlan, uh, where, uh, according to Paul, one of the will probably be one of the la best land-based places to see the eclipse. Uh, the northern half of the Paul gets these graphs on what the what the clouds were in certain areas. And he marks them on, on follows them on, on the, the days that the eclipse would normally have taken would have taken place. And basically, if you're anywhere north of about Tennessee, the cloud predictions based uh, based on uh, you know, with the eclipse being what I think is on the seventh, um, the uh, clouds north of Tennessee are pretty high and extremely low for Mazatlan. So that's why he set up a land tour. Uh, he's going to be on a, a boat tour for that, where the boat's going to tootle around in the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, Tamara Letty, Ted Blank, and myself will be leading the three land tours of 40, 40 people each. He wanted me to uh, emphasize there are only 15 spaces left out of 120. And that uh, at the moment, Connie and I are the only JSCS members signed up so far, even though this will be run under the JSCS banner and under the JSCAS flag. Okay, moving on. Uh, we are getting back to things. We've got a couple of requests that I'll tell. We'll, we'll process them as they go. But I think 
I won't say we're out of the woods because we still have, what is it? B B B one point B four five and point five. We still got a couple of variants out there. We got to see how well the vaccines that we have so far are doing it. But people are ready to return to work. I came back from a conference and people were so hungry for face to face interaction. They didn't care if the meeting sucked. They were just so happy to be with other people. So hopefully this will continue and uh, this the, the, the whole thing with COVID will continue to abate. So we'll just take the agenda as it comes. And with that, 70% of the earth is water and virtually none of it is carbonated. So for the flat earthers, it does make the earth in fact flat. That's all folks. Back to you, Doug. Okay, uh, David, that was funny. <laughs> the, the earth actually is flat, that's funny. I heard that one. Okay, very good. Thank you, David, for all that and for being our Star Party chairman. And yes, as David said, um, myself and some others have been talking about going Okie Tex and El Dorado both. So, you know, uh, it wasn't that long ago, we actually had, there were 16 members of the JSCAS at uh, the El Dorado Star Party. So uh, it's, it's actually pretty well attended. So you all might start thinking about uh, coming and, and uh, joining us for those. Okay, before we go, um, last month I mentioned that we lost our dear friend Hernan Contreras on April 20th. And I want to um, tell everybody about when his services are. So uh, Hernan Contreras' services are going to be on June 18th uh, at 10.30 a.m. So that's a week from tomorrow. It's on Saturday. It's going to be at St. Paul the Apostle Catholic Church at 18223. Lookout Drive. It's in Nassau Bay. It's across from JSC. And so they're going to have a mass for Hernan and uh, followed by a luncheon. So I'm not I'm not Catholic, um, Protestant, but um, I, my understanding is is a, a service they have for a person, and they call it a mass, even though it's not a regular mass, I guess. But we'll all go and and uh, see what this uh, see this. But uh, it'd be great if we could get some support for Hernan and his family. It'd be great if the JSCAS could have good turnout to uh, show Hernan what he's meant to our club. But I will also send this information out on the email distribution. So all of you will have that. I don't expect you to hurry up and write this down right now. I'll send it also out to the email distribution. But just in general, you can just be aware it's a week from tomorrow on Saturday at 1030 a.m. in the morning. And I'll send out the name of the church and the address again. And we got Hernan, uh, his family, a plaque made. It says Hernan Contreras, dear friend and cherished member of the Johnson Space Center Astronomical Society. And hopefully we'll have an opportunity to give that to Hernan's family uh, when we go to that on Saturday. All right, so that's it for this evening. Uh, our next meeting will be July 8th and we will have Al Mowry. He'll be bring, bringing us building my equatorial mount telescope. And this is actually, I'm looking forward to this. Al had his um, home well, custom made telescope out at the X-Bar Ranch this a uh, couple months ago. And it's uh, quite something. Uh, if you want to see some real workmanship and somebody who custom made something from the ground up, uh, this is it. <laughs> and uh, so uh, this is this is telescope making within the JSES. And uh, I hope you get, all can join us for that meeting next month. We're looking forward to it. Thank you for attending.